Welcome. This is Father Joe Chisetti. We're into Holy Week now, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the Triduum, the sacred Triduum, the three most important days of the year. Triduum is a rather unusual word. You don't hear it too often in any other circumstances. It's one of the few words, I think, in the English language that has two U's, one right after another. It means three days. And the sacred Triduum consists of the three days of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute. You were saying three days, and you just listed four days. What's up? Well, what's up is how you count days. In a situation like this, we use the Jewish reckoning of days. So, starting at sunset, Thursday evening to Friday evening is one day. Friday evening to Saturday evening is one day. Saturday evening to Sunday evening is one day. And even though we're not able to have a public celebration of these services this year, I want you to be familiar with them. I'd like you to learn more about them and to participate them, participate in them virtually as well. I'm going to talk about the way we do things usually, and then at the end I'll talk about the way we do things this year. So, Holy Thursday, the Mass of the Lord's Supper, probably one of the most beautiful Masses of the entire year. This kicks off the Triduum, and we remember something. We remember that this is the day Jesus gave us the Eucharist. Jesus' words, as Bishop Robin Bar Robert Barron would say, are effective. So, he says to a blind man, receive your sight, the man sees. He says to a woman who's sick, be well, and she becomes well. Jesus' words do what he says. And so he says, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. The bread becomes his body, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And the wine becomes body, blood, soul, and divinity as well. Jesus gifts himself to us in the Eucharist. And that's part of what we celebrate at this Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. But this gift of the Eucharist comes wrapped inside another gift, and that is the gift of the priesthood. So there's one gift that flows from another, and we remember both those gifts on that day. Now the Gospel that at that Mass gives us the Last Supper according to John, where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Do you realize what I have done for you, he says at the end. As I have done, so must you do. I have given you an example. And that is a reminder to all of us that as little Christs, as Christians, we're all called to live our lives in loving service. Now, at the beginning of this Mass, the tabernacle is empty. At the end, there is a procession with the Blessed Sacrament. We go through the church, and at St. Therese, we usually go, hopefully outside if the weather permits, into the Woolridge Center downstairs, where an altar of repose has been prepared. And the Blessed Sacrament is reserved there, and people continue to come and pray until midnight. I tell people, for me, that is the sweetest time of the whole year to pray. If I could only pray once a year, that's when I would do it. Holy Thursday is beautiful. But also, we're on the eve of the Passion. And so, when we're there, we start to think about Jesus in the garden. We think about Gethsemane. So, everything is really starting at this point. Good Friday. Good Friday is the emptiest day of the year. The church is empty, the tabernacle is empty, the altar is bare. It is a day of fast and abstinence. We remember this is the day Jesus died for us. I remember even as a child thinking of the morning, well, okay, this is when Jesus was on trial. This was when Jesus was before Pilate. This is when he was carrying the cross. And this is when he was dying for us on the cross. Now, the stations of the cross are often prayed. Obviously, we're not going to be able to gather for that this year, but 
on our YouTube channel, there is a version of the Stations of the Cross that Father Andrew and I prayed, and you're welcome to pray that with us. The commemoration of the Lord's Passion you ideally takes place at 3 p.m. We do it at 7 p.m. so that more people can participate. So we enter the church in silence. People kneel, the priests and deacons prostrate themselves before the altar. Then we get up and there is an opening prayer. And then we have a liturgy of the word. There is a very long, beautiful reading from the prophet Isaiah, a psalm, a New Testament reading, and then the Passion according to John. And each of the Passion narratives have their own emphasis, their own take, if you will, on what's going on. On Good Friday, we always hear the Passion according to John. There's a homily. And then usually at a Mass, you know, we have the prayers of the faithful. Well, we have these intercessions as well, but they're set uh, there's a whole lot of them, and it goes on for a while. Quite often they're chanted. There's an introduction. We pray. Quite often we kneel for that. And then there is a prayer that the presiding priest will say. And then we do it again. And then we do it again. And then we do it again. And we're praying for the Pope and for our bishop and for the church. And we pray for non-believers. We pray for those who don't share the Catholic faith. We pray for the whole world. We pray for everyone. I, I haven't. I can't remember. I think there's ten of those that we do. So we're standing and kneeling a lot. But hey, it's a day of penance, all right? Uh, there's going to be an additional one this year because of the pandemic. There's a special one that's going to be inserted into that. That concludes the Liturgy of the Word. After that, we have the veneration of the cross. So a large cross is brought in, and then people are invited to venerate the cross. Some people touch it, some people kiss it, some people stand before it. We have a big enough cross that can take people from many different sides all at once. And it's very moving just to think about the crosses in our own lives, the struggles that we have, maybe just within ourselves, with other people, in our families, in our world, with diseases, who knows what. But we look at our crosses in the light of the cross of Christ. And we realize that he suffers with us, and so we do not face these alone. We face these with him, that he has shared in our sufferings. So it's very moving just to watch people, particularly if you know people, and you know, well, this person's dealt with cancer, this person's been widowed or something. Watch these people come up and venerate the cross. And even when you see the little children come up, you say, well, for a, lot, for a lot of them, well, not much of a cross in their lives yet. There will be. So we seek to embrace the cross in our lives. After that, the Blessed Sacrament is brought forth. There is no Mass on Good Friday. So the Blessed Sacrament is brought forth. We pray the Our Father, we receive communion, and then we leave in silence. Saturday is another empty day. Mass is not celebrated until the evening, until it's dark. And we remember Jesus' descent among the dead. So then we start with the Easter Vigil. The Easter Vigil was supposed to be after uh, the sun is going down. The Easter Vigil is called the Mother of All Vigils. Okay? It's really the highlight of the entire liturgical year. It's not short, but it's marvelous. So generally, we gather outside. There is a fire that's been lit. The fire is blessed. And we have the new Easter candle. And the candle is prepared. And as we're preparing it, we say, Christ, yesterday, today, the same and always, to him be glory forever and ever, or something to that effect. Five nails are put into the candle to remind you of the five wounds of Christ. By his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ, our Savior, guard us and keep us safe, more or less is what it says. The candle is lit. May the light of Christ, rising in the darkness, may the light of Christ dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. We process towards the entrance to the church, 
and the deacon will chant Christ our light, and we chant back, thanks be to God. We go into church, all the baptized are holding candles. We start lighting the candles. And again, one third higher, Christ our light, and we respond one third higher. Thanks be to God. And then, all the way up to the altar, a third time, Christ our light, thanks be to God. The whole church is awash with candlelight at this point. The lights are turned on, and the deacon will chant the exalted. This is an ancient hymn of the church, going back, I believe, to St. Ambrose of Milan in the 4th century. For, so in other words, for nearly the whole history of Christianity, this is one of the ways we've been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. So the Easter Vigil is like a play in four acts. So Act 1 is the service of light. Then we start listening to the scriptures reading, the scripture readings. Uh, there's up to seven Old Testament readings with a psalm in between and a prayer after each one. We don't do all of them. There are some options there. But we start with creation. So we're staying up, we're keeping vigil, and we're telling stories. We're telling the stories of our people. Ever have the experience of maybe Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner or something? You're sitting around the table, and towards the end, Grandpa says, Did I ever tell you what it was like when I was in WW2, the big one? And you say, yes, let me tell you what it was like. Okay, and you start to hear this story again. We've heard these stories before, but these are our family stories. These are the stories of who we are as God's family. After the last Old Testament reading, the Gloria is intoned. We haven't used it much, just a couple times during the season of Lent, and the bells start ringing. After the glory on the Holy Thursday Mass, the bells are silent, inside and outside. And so now the bells are ringing, the candles are lit. And so we continue on. There is a New Testament reading. And then we intone the Alleluia. We have been fasting from Alleluia since the beginning of Lent. And now we break forth into this beautiful, wonderful Alleluia praising God. There is a gospel giving an account of the resurrection. There is a homily. That takes care of Act 2. We come to Act 3. Act 3 is an act with four different scenes. The first one, scene 1, our elect, the people who had been catechumens before, those who are unbaptized, who are seeking baptism, are called forward. With the Easter candle, we process through the church to the baptismal font, and we're chanting the litany of the saints. When we chant the litany of the saints, it reminds us of how big the church is and how it's more than just us here and now. It goes through space and time. We're part of something much bigger than ourselves. And we gather around the baptismal font. The baptismal font is the womb of the church. The holy water is blessed. The candle is dipped three times into the water. And then those to be baptized make a profession of the faith. And then one by one, they enter into the water. St. Paul says when we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we are baptized into his death so that we might share in his resurrection. That is really the pivotal moment of our lives. That's when we become Christians. And so one by one, they enter into the baptismal waters. They kneel down and we usually, if I'm doing it, I will chant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And people will chant, Amen. And then they will come out, and then they are clothed with a white garment, signifying new life in Christ. And then they are given a lit candle. And then they go to dry off. But there's the next part. Act 3, scene 2, involves all of us. 
our candles are relit because we make a renewal of our baptismal promises. Lent has been for us a 40-day retreat as we prepare to make this renewal. And so we are asked six questions. And it's very simple. All you have to do is say, I do. I encourage people, though, to say it loud and say it proud. Do you reject sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God? Do you reject the glamour of evil and refuse to be mastered by sin? Do you reject Satan, father of sin and prince of darkness? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church? And so then, as a renewal, as a reminder of that, uh, there's a sprinkling of holy water in everyone. Act 3, Scene 3. Our candidates, those who are already one with us through the sacrament of baptism and who seek full communion in the Catholic Church, come forward and they make a profession of the Catholic faith. And then the newly baptized join them and they all receive the sacrament of confirmation. That's Act 3, Scene 4. And so we're building up and now we're coming to Act 4, the Liturgy of the Eucharist. It's pretty much what we usually have, uh, except for those newly received to the church, they will be making their first communion. The Blessed Sacrament is finally reposed back in the tabernacle. And then Mass in, go forth, the Mass is ended, and there's the double Alleluia, 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 thanks be to God, Alleluia, Alleluia. And so that concludes the Easter Vigil. Easter Sunday, we continue to rejoice in the light of the risen Christ. And so there is Mass. Again, there is a renewal of baptismal promises. Before the Alleluia, there is another uh, old ancient sequence. don't know how far it goes back, but it is hundreds of years. It's called the Victime Pascale. To the vac Paschal Victim, praises bring. Absolutely beautiful hymn. And at one point it has Mary Magdalene saying, Christ my hope has arisen. Christ, my hope, has arisen. So you want to listen to, for that during Mass on Easter Sunday. And then that will wrap up. Uh, we have those celebrations of the Masses. There's a Mass in the afternoon. But, well, when there is a Mass in the afternoon, there isn't always one. There won't be this year. But the Gospel reading is the risen Christ appearing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. In my mind, uh, perhaps the most beautiful story in the entire Bible. Uh, if not the most, it's certainly one of the most. Uh, Christ journeying with them, and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. So that concludes the Easter Vigil. I'm sorry, that concludes, that concludes the Paschal Triduum, those three days. Now, we continue to celebrate, though. We continue to celebrate... Easter week is called a week of Sundays. Every day at Mass, there's a Gloria. Every day, there is that double Alleluia at the end of Mass. And it doesn't stop there. We continue to celebrate Easter for 50 days all the way to Pentecost, to the 50th day. We spend 40 days preparing. We spend 50 days celebrating. Not bad. We come out ahead, don't we, huh? Now, as I said, there is something else to consider for this year because, tragically, we're not going to be having congregations with us, or at least, unfortunately, I mean, we want everyone to be safe, but it's going to be really different this year without having you there. But we will continue to have these celebrations, and we encourage you to watch them. And there are going to be, there are some changes to what I described recently, because that's what we usually do. Orders from the Vatican, things are going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, Mass, the Lord's Supper, there will be no washing of the feet. The Blessed Sacrament will stay reserved in the tabernacle. Uh, on Good Friday, there will uh, be the veneration of the cross, but there will be no touching or kissing of the cross. Uh, again, obviously, we want to keep everyone safe. 
at the Easter Vigil. We've had to defer the baptisms and receptions into the church. So everything I talked about in Act 3, scene th Act three Scenes 1, 2, 3, and 4, well, Scenes 1, 3, and 4 are going to be omitted. We are going to be doing, however, the renewal of our baptismal promises. And so Easter Sunday would be the same, except the fact that we're not going to have people with us, unfortunately. But we continue to be united. We continue to be united in prayer. We continue to be united in the Eucharist, even when we are physically apart. And we will continue to rejoice in the Paschal Mystery, in the light of the risen Christ. In baptism, we enter into that mystery. We continue to live it in our lives. And in our death, we will enter it into it even more fully. We live our lives in the hope and the light of Jesus, risen from the dead.